Dobar večir in dobrodošli na drugem spletnem pogovoru tujih avtorjev z njihovimi prevajavkami na letošnjem sejmu knjige Podilka. Danes boste lahko spremljali pogovor med prevajavko Petrom Terc in Sanđivom Sahoto, britanskim romanopiscem sikulskega porekla. Njegov roman iz leta 2011, Prvenec, Hours are the streets, ki ga je zaradi dela pisal ob večirih in vikendih, pripoveduje prvo osebno zgodbo britansko-pakistanskega mladeniča, ki postane samo morinski napadanec. Leta 2013 ga je Revija Granta imenovala za enega najbolj perspektivnih mladih britanskih piscev. Še več uspeha pa je doživel z romanom Leto v bežnikov ali v izvirniku The Year of the Runaways iz leta 2015, ki mu je prinesel nagrado Evropske unije za književnost in pristal v ožjem izboru za nagrado Booker. Roman Leto v bežnikov je tik pred izidom v slovenskem prevodu pri založbi Put police dubove, s katero pripravljamo pričajoči programski sklop. In je tako prvi Sahotov roman, ki je preveden v slovenščini. Sahota se v tej romaneskni sadi loteva aktualne tematike migracij, ki jo postavi v naduse o prijemljive okvire vsak dana. Perhaps for the beginning, I would like to um, ask you how, what led you to write this novel in the first place? Um, and how long did it take you? Because I read that you wrote your first uh, Hours Are the Streets novel while you were still working. And I was wondering what was the process with the second novel? How much time did it take? And um, did you still work or not at the time? Mm. Yeah, you're right. I was working full time while I wrote my first novel, Hours Are the Streets. And I wrote that in the evenings and at the weekends and during um, in the holiday periods. Um, with, the, the, with the year of the noise, it was kind of 50-50. About halfway through writing that novel, um, I was in a position where I could leave full-time work. Um, it Because it, it, a publisher had bought it, my publisher bought that year, the year of the noise based on, um, you know, just a few, a few chapters, um, which put me in a position where I could just concentrate on it full-time. Um, so I'd say two thirds of that book was written, actually yeah, more than 50%, but two thirds of the book was written um, with me working on it full time, which was wonderful in lots of ways, but it's also really strange. I don't feel like I worked any more on the book than I compared to ours other streets. It's almost like the work just expands to fill whatever time you've got to do it in, that, that old kind of economics law. Um, so it still took uh, you know, three years to finish, three, four years to complete. And I suppose it is a bigger book and it's, 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 it's on a larger canvas, so to speak. Um, but in terms of the process of writing it, Ours on the Streets felt quite organic. You know, there's a lot of stopping and starting and, and scrapping drafts and doing it again. I felt like I was learning about that book as I was going, and probably because I didn't really plan it out at the beginning at all. Whereas with The Year of the Runaways, I did spend a lot of time before writing a word, just planning the story out and trying to understand how the characters would move through the year and what their histories and pasts were, um, which I think enabled me just to go through the writing of that book in a slightly more stately and dignified fashion rather than just you know, going, oh, God, there's a mistake, scrapping and starting again all the time. Um, so it was a, a, a kind of a more considered process, I think, writing that book, which I think you can tell in, I think you can tell when you look at those two books, there's kind of a turbulence to ours of the streets and a kind of a in more of a, a classical kind of tone to the year of the runaways, which I think has a lot to do with the process of writing those books as much as anything else. Um, I wrote um, the first chapter of the year of the runaways first, and then I wrote actually those three large kind of mini chapters which go into the characters' histories. Then I wrote those three chapters because I wanted to just, I felt I needed to do that just to, so I knew how they came to be where they were in the opening chapter. Um, and, and then I went back and wrote the rest of the book, filled in those missing chapters early on, and then carried on with the rest of the book once all the characters were kind of explained and in situ. Um, so that was kind of the, the process of writing it. And it, yeah, it took about three, three years or so to write. And there's a year of editing with my editor and publisher before it actually just finally um, hit the shelves. And did you... Uh the structure is very carefully planned in this book as you mentioned uh, did you before 
sitting down and writing, did you plan the structure first or did you think of it, you know, uh, while you were writing it already and, you know, just uh, piecing it together? No, unlike Ours Are the Streets, which wasn't planned at all, I did plan the structure for the Odin Ways quite, quite closely. I knew I wanted to open with all four characters arriving in Sheffield and there to be a question mark about how they got to be you know, there, you know, so far away from their home. And then slowly I wanted to go back and reveal um, reveal that to the reader. And I started off with Dodgy because I felt he was a, he's the last character to arrive in chapter one, really. He's kind of like the, the outsider, the interloper who kind of like arrives and which is a kind of an archetype, isn't it, in, in novels when the stranger comes in and sends everyone into a bit of a, a tiz. Um, so I started off with his history because I thought that would be the most surprising thing to do. And also because I wasn't quite sure how he came to be in, in Sheffield um, at, the turn of, at the turn of the century. So I was interested in that as well. Um, and then I knew I wanted to keep Narinda as a mystery for as long as possible. I wanted to keep the reader sort of kind of enthralled to her and about questioning her motives about why is she doing what she's doing. So I knew I wanted to leave her history till uh, to be the final one of the four that are revealed. So there's Dodgy, then there's Ndeep and Avatar who arrive together as a unit almost. And I think that that's why when they do separate about two thirds of the way through novel, it does hit home because they're considered as very much being a pair, I think for much of that early part of the novel until circumstances force them one to betray the other. And then Narinda comes in and I was really happy that um, she is the last one to be sort of um, her history, the last one whose history is shown to the reader, because she's almost like the, she almost becomes the moral centre of the book, and she's the character around which the boys all kind of orbit, I think. So I wanted to leave that that question unanswered for as long as I could. And it's not that long, it's about halfway through the novel, and then once all four characters, you know kind of how they got to be where they are, then almost like the narrative engine just takes a second life, and it kind of like just, there's momentum to the book then, I think, which carries it through to the through the second half of the book. So I know I wanted that kind of structure where have them arriving, explain how they got there in a way that sort of enthralls and kind of enchants and sort of, um, but doesn't answer too much and then have a real strong second, you know, the second half which builds on that momentum from the first half. Uh, the characters, they all come from different backgrounds class, uh, caste, um, did, you, did you have to do much research regarding some of the particularities of, you know, the backgrounds of the characters and, and their, you know, because I, I think that each, uh, I think the, the, best, uh, the best quality of this novel for me is how, how different they all are, you know, and they're still mm -hmm. stuck in the same positions almost and, but, uh, the deeper you 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 dwell into their stories, you just you just realize they're completely different mm. in terms of their you know initial position. You're right; they are totally different. But the tragedy is the society that they find themselves in. All treat treat them all as as one and as um as a kind of a, a homogenous block without nuance and without particular specific histories. Um, research, I. So I think I, I kind of feel I've been researching this novel my whole life because it's it's set in you know it's set in Sheffield, which is a, a city I know well and a city I grew up um, beside. And and the other um, setting that's very important to it is is India, and that's a country that I also Punjab in India, a state in the northwest of India, is a place I know really well. It's where my family kind of hail from. It's um, it's where I've still got a large kind of um, family contingent there. I, before all this COVID stuff happened, I was I visited there. You know, I go there every annually. Um, so I know that part of India um, quite well, and I know the stories um, that kind of inhabit that space. The stories of men, mostly men, but also women, women as well, who are desperate to come to the West and the steps they take to come to the West, and whether they're kind of selling their organs or taking on you know incredible amounts of debt or remortgaging their land or the desperate kind of um, acts they commit to try to fund their passage over over to to europe um, those are stories i've been hearing 
kind of my my entire life and when i go to india you always meet people who have been over to england and living here illegally then you know they come back and you speak to them and they you know tell you what life was like how difficult it was how they kind of made ends meet how they lived how they ate and um, sometimes how they you know didn't have a roof over their heads so those are stories that are all they've almost just been always there and it's not a secret conversation in in india at least in that part of india it's kind of it's it's just it's it's an open kind of discussion that happens in markets in bazaars around the temple people are always going to be exchanging ideas about how they can sort of um make their way over or or, or the trials that they experience when they do make it over it's it's an open it's an open conversation so and because i'm just naturally quite curious about people's lives it's it's one i've always kind of felt myself tuned to um, um so i didn't feel i had to do any formal you know field research and go out and interview people it was just all it's always been it's always been there and i was wondering because you have three characters that come to england and then you have uh, narinder who is uh, there already did you um how was planning her character and developing her character different in this sense you know that was it perhaps also um your personal experience that you portrayed uh, more on narinder because she's she comes from the diaspora already yeah um i think the part of narinder when well, narinder came about initially because i want i knew i wanted a a character who was a visa wife he was going to marry one of these um boys from india to help him get across to the uk and then my question was always well, what why would someone do that um and the obvious reason is uh, there's an economic reason you know they do it for for the money but i knew i had three characters who who are also very driven by their economic and their financial circumstances and didn't really want narinda to also be kind of driven by her her economic um kind of position so i thought well another a more interesting way would be to be if she's driven by a sense of wanting to do good or wanting to help someone and if that's driven by a kind of a religious conviction um and it is a question that you know because i do have cousins who are in or or who have been in the in the position of randi of the doji um and it is always and they do sometimes feel they do question me about what my role is in sort of helping them or understanding them or portraying them so it is a kind of a vexed question i think for many people in the diaspora about what does it mean to be good to you know your not just your fellow man but also to fellow members of your family who are in difficulty and do need um but what am i asked for some sort of assistance what 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 do what do i owe them and i think it was that question that kind of lingers inside narinda and kind of is probably an element of her personality that i was kind of um, i was drawing on that particular question which is also a question that i think i do still use much more earlier on but do still kind of wrestle with i think at times and when writing about the experiences of you know migrants who do have definitely a marginal status in europe and elsewhere in the world um what were you most careful about uh, regarding this representation that you put into your book of you know the newcomers the migrants uh... yeah it's very interesting because you know the the kind of the the impulse and the conviction is always to portray them as sympathetically and in a way that's going to make people um you know want to want to and kind of help them or want to sort of understand them more deeply but my my conviction as a writer is always to be as truthful and to be as honest as i can about these characters and and the truth is that these you know, you know immigrants or migrants or living here illegally or, or even under just dubious circumstances you know there is as prone to behaving appallingly and as and as sort of as escapelessly and as and as badly as as anyone else they can you know they it might be driven by an you know a situation which is much harder than those of of which of compared to people who do you know live here by birth um but I, th- i think my conviction was always to portray them as as humanly as possible and to show them being good but also being bad because i think that's what's going to make people think that they are real and their situation is real and their their um 
their, you know, their, their difficulties are real. So I didn't want to sanitize um, these characters or portray them as, as totally as victims or people that we should feel sorry for. I wanted to just portray them as, as, as humanly as I could, full of the complexity and the difficulties of being a human in, in the world today. Um, so I think that was sort of my main, yeah, that, that's always been my main aim. I didn't want them to be, obviously they are the victims of kind of terrible racism as well, but they're also the victim of the, vi the victim of the attitudes of people in their so-called own community who don't treat them well either. And that, I think it was important for me to be honest about that as well. Actually, there's people in, in, in the UK who you'd think might be more um, sympathetic to, to these men, but actually then you know, oftentimes they're, they're the worst perpetrators and make life more difficult for, for the men than they, than they might otherwise need to. So it's important just to be as honest about their situation and about their humanity as, as I could. And the novel came out in 2015, right? Yeah. And um, it was also the year that, you know, the, there, there was uh, like thousands of, of newcomers to yeah. Europe as well. It was, it kind of collided uh, your book with yeah. this period. And the Syrian um, refugee, so-called refugee crisis, you know, well, yeah, all that was um, happening, yeah. Did you, did you get a lot of response uh, connecting your novel to what was going on, you know, politically in the society in Europe at that time? Yeah, it's really like strange. I mean, everyone kept on all the lots of reviewers and readers kept on saying that it's such a topical, timely book, and how like how it's just come out at just the right time. And there was also in England we had um, Theresa May was our Home sec Secretary at that time, and she went on, of course, to become Prime Minister. And there was this hostile environment towards um, immigrants in the UK. There were these vans going around saying like "Go home" and all this kind of awful awful behavior on behalf of our, from our government. Um, so everyone kept saying just how topical and timely it is. And I just felt, well, if it's, if it's topical and timely, it's been that way for 2000 years. You know, this story isn't, the story of people wanting to, or trying to make their way across borders to improve their life is, isn't new. It's always been there. So it never, it doesn't feel timely or particularly resonant now. I just feel like it, this is just how it's always been until we do redefine the way we think about borders and homelands and our attitude towards and um people in different parts of the world and our choice toward the wealth distribution until those change those attitudes change this story is always going to be needing to be told and um i was also wondering um in the novel your language is uh, specific in the sense that you uh, use a lot of words that are not of English origin, and you just put them inside into the text. And um, mm. I was wondering, how do you think about that? How do you think about, you know, in infusing English with foreign words that, you know, the common English or, mm. you know, uh, English reading uh, reader yeah. won't understand? How did you uh, consider this when you were writing it? Yeah, no, uh, good question. I am. Um... It's interesting because it's I, I'm writing I'm just finishing writing my third novel now and I've taken a different approach then because the book demands a different approach whereas with the year of ways first you're right there's a lots of untranslated Punjabi in in the book and my reasons for that are kind of and I don't I don't I don't I don't have a glossary I don't have a glossary in the book um, and I don't think there's one in the translation either I don't I can't remember um, but it seemed quite necessary to me that for the novel in, in English, at least, that things weren't kind of explained or handed to the reader on a plate too easily. I thought these young boys, they're coming to, to the UK, they're confused, they don't know what's happening, they're in a state of tumult. Um, in, uh, and there's a, this is a constant question of them trying to work out the country, work out their position in the country. And I wanted the language um, to reflect that for the reader. I want the reader to be to be put in a similar position to those characters. So I think if, I think if the reader is reading the book and they come across you know, a sentence or two in Punjabi and they're confused and they can't work out what it means and they're trying to kind of piece things together, I think that interestingly puts the reader in the position of the character. So it's quite important for me to have that parallel. It's one of the kind of more, I'd like to think kind of more the 
it's kind of the art of this particular book. Um, also, it's, it's a book that's very much about um, kind of a subculture, an interior, a very internal and interior world. So I wanted there to be that sense of um, secrecy, kind of things being things being known only to the boys. I think having those kind of those that, that element of um, Punjabi and the words being untranslated kind of adds adds to that as well. That like this is a secret world that you'll be that we're almost just overhearing. The reader's almost just like being allowed into it um, for this one year. Um, um, so those were, I think were the main reasons why I thought it was important for me not to have um, a glossary or the Punjabi words translated, or to even have them in italics. I think it was quite important for me in the in the novel in English that like, there is. That sense, because uh, I think italicizing words, foreign words, so called foreign words, can other them, it creates this othering. Kind of like this, this is something that's different, this is something that's not part of the English language. And I didn't want that sense. I want this is all, this is all just a, a unified whole, unified kind of uh, representation of these men in England. And it's quite important for me to tell that. And also, of course, and if things don't make sense in context, if you know if the reader doesn't make sense of something, then I think that's fine. I think that's okay. It's just part of the, the the music of the book and the background of the book. And you know, no one asks, no one would ask a kind of a white British author, the white American author, to explain something for an Indian audience. You know, so I don't see why I should have to go out of my way to explain something for any other audience either. I think it should be it should be a given that this is what's right for the book and what's this what this is what represents these characters. Um, this is how language is being used to represent these characters' interior world most effectively. Um, I also read somewhere in one of your interviews, I think, that you you say that you learn most from reading. And I was wondering which books would uh, do you think that kind of like gave you the most knowledge or inspired you the most to write The Year of the Runaways? Um, a big influence, I think, is Rohinton Mysteries, A Fine Balance which is a novel set in India during the um, Indira Gandhi's emergency in 1974-75. Um, so that, that book, it's a big book. It's you know, 708 pages. It's about four characters who come together in Bombay and about their uh, kind of their difficulties over the course of two or three months. And just the, I read that book when I, was, when I must have been about 1920 and it just, blew me away really it was the first book that properly absorbed me and kind of made me really just care deeply about the characters and their fates and I knew that I wanted to write well I think this the other one is kind of my attempt to write a book which does something similar I wanted to write a book where the reader feels really invested in the characters and really cares about where they end up and I almost think that if ours of the, if ours of the streets was a book about kind of there's a nod to kind of my kind of adolescence and my past and how I feel about England. I think the other way is almost like a nod to my history of reading, really, the books that kind of made me want to be a reader. So A Fine Balance, and also there's big Russian novels, Anna Karenina, you know, another book that you know, I just kind of totally fell in love with and um, made me really just want to, just didn't want to, maybe not want to leave those characters. Um, so I think those were kind of the, the big books that made me want to write a kind of a, a large immersive kind of kind of character, you know, book with a with an ensemble cast and characters that like you don't want to that you don't want to sort of depart from. I really wanted to. I think the future I mean, the future holds. I think different kinds of books. Whereas, but I think the other one is almost like a it's it's kind of me doffing my cap to the books that made me want to become a reader, um, and also lots of Irish novelists, particularly John McGahan. Um, the late John McGahan, who wrote wonderfully about religion and guilt and shame and, and sex. And I think um, I love that kind of that's, that particular strand of Irish writing as well, lyrical, but very much attuned to the emotional turmoil of a character as well. And well, the, the book was uh, shortlisted for the Booker Prize. So it got a really great response uh, everywhere in the West. And I was wondering what, what was some specific, if there were some uh, response uh, from the readers in India, perhaps, or um, from your own diaspora that you got uh, after publishing the book? 
Yeah, no, the response, I mean, as a whole was just hugely positive and it really, you know, it just it kind of just shifted things for me as a writer, enabled me to just be a full-time writer and and it was wonderful. I mean, the response in, it's interesting how the response in India was different to the response in the UK in, in one way, whereas loads of UK readers, whether from the diaspora or, or not, said, we, uh, you know, we we you know we really admired the like the bits set in set in the UK, but the bits in India, those kind of chapters were amazing, and they told us so much that we didn't know about these these young men's histories. And then, of course, when I went to India, they'd say, "Yeah, we like the bits in India, but we kind of know all that." But the bits in the UK, they were the ones that they you know that told us so much. It's like people it's always, you know, yeah, it's it's what they don't know, I suppose, that most captures people um, with this book in particular. So that was quite an interesting. Um, kind of juxtaposition I felt in readers' responses. But no, the, the reviews in India and the readers' response were, were just really wonderful and and they really responded to Dodgy's story. I think there's a lot, there's, there's a sense in India when they were talking about Dodgy's story, because of course the readers in India who will read a book in English are of a certain class, they, you know, they you know, tend to be of the upper middle class, they can read in English, they probably have quite, you know, they're living a reason, you know, a reasonably comfortable life compared to the people like Dodgy. So I think it's almost like, and caste is still, you know, it's a shame factor in India, in Bolivar, where it's kind of it's the thing that the middle classes in India don't talk about. You know, they know it happens, but they just kind of choose to not sort of um, gaze at it um, for too for too long a time. So there was an element of when of some of the readers' responses were thinking, yeah, this this happens and. You know, we need to address it, or you know, we feel quite ashamed about it. There was, there was, there was a bit of it was touching a nerve with a certain section of um, that kind of Indian readership, which I thought was interesting, and the kind of the shame they still carry in around ideas of caste and how it does still absolutely control people's lives in quite a horrific way. And also, I think the a, a specific i mean sheffield is also kind of almost like a character in the novel because uh, you you feel I, i've never visited sheffield but i kind of feel like i know it a bit now after mm -hmm. reading your novel could you talk a bit about this you know how you consider sheffield as you know transporting it into your writing and and why is it like an important place for you to to embed yeah. into the writing as well yeah, well, Sheffield is, you know, I grew up near Sheffield and grew up in Sheffield and it's where I've kind of, it's a city that's always been closest to me and I live in Sheffield now and have done for a long time and it's a city I love, it's a city that I think is just wonderful, just the topography of the city, it's very hilly, um, it's got lots of sort of in the countryside, the Peak District, which is a big national park, is on the doorstep, but there's also quite a vibrant um, city culture as well, it's a wonderfully diverse city, I really enjoy just walking around um the place it means a lot to me um and actually when i'm writing i do find well with these with these characters in particular i think that kind of one of the things in the novel one of the points of the novel is that these these young men will go anywhere they don't really they just happen to end up in sheffield and they end up in sheffield because that's the city i know best and i decided to set the novel in sheffield but it could be set in you know in west london or in birmingham or in you know in, in nottingham any of like the, the big cities this story could have been there because these boys will get anywhere. They will, you know, they will shovel shit. They will clean sewers. They will do whatever they have to do and go wherever they have to go to earn enough money to to survive and to live. Um, so Sheffield as a place wasn't really that important to the book in the sense that it's not important to the characters. It just happens to be where they'll go for this year and then they'll and even in, even within the year they travel to other parts of the UK because they need to for money. Um, and I always felt that even for me as a writer, I've always think place really isn't that, or place in England isn't really that important to me when I'm setting a book in the UK. It happens to be Sheffield because that's where I know, but I, think, but I don't really, I, I always feel that it's a bit of a cheat because I don't think that, because I think my relationship with England is so sort of, complicated and perplexed and my question about where I belong in England is quite a difficult question for me and how welcome I feel in England is continues to be a question that I kind of a, a, I pick at I think as a consequence I, I kind of feel a bit like always at one at one remove from any England whether any city in England I compare it to my um, my cousins who are in India 
who have born and grown up in it and kind of the kind of the visceral love they feel for that place and for for their land and I I remember growing up and feeling quite wistful and quite sad that I didn't really have that in England I didn't really feel that you know I I, I admire lots of things in England I there, there's several you know there's a million things I love about it but I'm not sure I had that actual deep deep love for the land because it just wasn't because I contend that I wasn't allowed to feel that because of the society I grew up in. Um, I think as a consequence of that, my relationship to place in my books is always a, a tricky one. It's set in Sheffield and I try to depict it as closely and, and as realistically and hopefully as sympathetically and, and as I can because I do love the city. But I think there's always a, a kind of a question around how how close I can get to that city. And therefore I, I think there's always, it always feels slightly odd in the book, I think, the question of Sheffield. So I'm, I'm glad you said it felt quite real, which makes me, makes me think okay, I did a good job of disguising my own sort of relationship with the city or with the country. So I'm glad that it didn't, it, it worked for you, yeah. Well, it worked from the, uh, from the perspective of, of the characters, obviously, yeah. so yeah. Um, I was also uh, wondering uh, if you could, uh, I, I read that you're teaching now. Yeah, I just started teaching. Um, um, I was wondering, what do you tell your students now about writing? What, what, uh, how does it feel to do that now, for example? Yeah, it's really odd because I, I started teaching just about a year ago at, um, at university level at Durham. Um, and it's what I enjoy about it is just how it makes me think more closely about my own writing, I mean, which sounds quite a selfish way I teach here, it's a selfish thing to say, but um, it's interesting how it makes me get into the DNA of my own work and about why I, why I write in the way I do and what, why I make the choices I do. And um, because of course, you know, teaching creative writing or teaching any art I'd contend, there's, there's, there can't really be a sense that I'm the expert and I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm gonna deliver my wisdom to you students and you will, it's, it's very much, the tutor learns as much as the um, as the students in many ways. Um, so I love actually interrogating my own work by by considering what the students have produced or said or done. Um, what do I tell them? I tell them. You know, I tell them if, if you can possibly not be a writer, you know, if you can possibly do something else, that's it's probably better to do something else because it's not easy. Um, um, and I tell them, you know, I think I'm probably quite, am I quite, I tell them to think of character, but then this, is, this is problem is that every time you tell the right, every, anytime you tell students to think about, to concentrate on something, you can always come up with a counterexample about how it could be done elsewhere, which is kind of the great, wonderful thing of the novel is that there are no rules. You can do, you can, if you do it well, you can do whatever you want to do. I think that's what I tell them. If you want to you know, write whatever you want to write, but do it well and find that thing that you really feel passionate about. I, and I do tell them to um, spend some time at the beginning thinking really hard about what it is that really sort of ignites you and like fires you up and what's that burning bush you really want to, that means a lot. And sometimes that might mean going into yourself or sometimes it might mean going out there into the world. But, um, you know, it's writing's much, it's never easy, but it's easier if you can, if you can write about, if you can write a story that only you can tell. And a new novel of yours is coming out next year. Yeah, in next. Could you um, tell us a bit about uh, what's um, what's it about, or just some uh, yeah. perhaps uh, info about uh, how you were, how was the process now with the third novel? Yeah, it was it was an odd process. It felt like I kind of like I it almost felt like the novel was telling me what it wanted to be about and how I should write it because I started off writing it in one way. And that wasn't working, so I, I put that aside and started writing. Spent two, three years writing other novels and trying to work out what that novel is. And slowly, I just kept coming back to coming back and back and back to that original idea. So almost like I almost reversed into um, that original novel that I started off, and then it changed. And of course, it, you know, but it was a really odd process where I felt like the novel was teaching me what what it what it needed to be about. Um, it's quite a personal book. It's quite a short book. It's, it's not much more than 50,000 words. So it's kind of disgusting that it took over nearly six years to write. Um, and it's, it's kind of partly, it's partly based on um, kind of 
my family history or my kind of a family legend, you know, from 100 years ago that's kind of been passed down. Um, I've kind of drawing on that. I don't want to say too much about it. So I apologize, Petra, I'm being quite vague and mysterious. Um, so I'm drawing on kind of my family history. It's mostly set in um, India, but it's set in both 1929 and in 1999. So it's got two strands running through it. And yeah, it's, it's going to be out um, yeah, next, next spring, summertime. Um, yeah, I'm a bit anxious about it because it is quite different. It's quite formally kind of, it's more kind of more obviously innovative compared to, I think, my previous books. There's more, there's structurally, there's more, um, there's a bit more going on, I think. But yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it being published. I'm looking forward to reading it as well. <laughs> I think that's it. We have around uh, half an hour as it was planned. Brilliant. Um, that was good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Petra. That was great. What, when does it come out? Do you, you have a date already? Or uh, Yeah, it's May. In, in the UK, it's May. Then in the US, it's July. Great. But yeah. Oh, sorry. It's called China Room. I should have said the name. It's called China Room. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We will check it out definitely and read it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Petra. Yeah.